Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's AMPC webinar, which is the first, which will first focus on COVID and the COVID vaccinations, followed by an update from the Department of Agriculture. Our presenters for today's session are Chris Ma from Go Respond Global and Stuart Loudon from the Department of Agriculture. Chris is Respond Global Senior Specialist Advisor, Health Emergencies, and has been working in the public health sector for more than three decades. With a highly distinguished career with the World Health Organization, working on the front line of polio eradication and immunization program management. Chris was appointed Chief Scientist and Senior Advisor to the Global Program in 2012. In January 2018, Chris was awarded the title of Officer of the Order of Australia by the Government of Australia in recognition for his work in this area. More recently, Chris was Senior Advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization in Geneva. Since his retirement, I think he's actually got busier now that um, we are in the pandemic known as COVID. So welcome, Chris. Our other presenter is Stuart who is the National Veterinary Technical Manager for the Department of Agriculture and has 25 years demonstrated experience leading and managing life science programs in academia and industry. He is committed to the ethical treatment of animals and for helping others find the best in themselves to achieve career goals. Stuart is skilled in building stakeholder relationships, evidence-based clinical medicine, trial management, drug development, biotechnology, quality management systems, lead auditing, tertiary teaching and staff training. He has an experienced management professional in a PhD in immunobiology. So thank you, Stuart, for also joining. For those that are new to the system, we really encourage you to ask questions today. So if you have a question, please type your question in on your toolbar and at the appropriate time, we will endeavour to answer all your questions. So firstly, I might hand over to you. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks very much, Amanda. I hope you can hear me clearly. Yes, perfectly. I don't know if you can turn your camera on, but then everyone might be able to see you as well. Oh, <laughs> given my um, technological capacity, I'm a little bit worried about being able to share my screen and turn my camera on at the same time. But I promise That's when okay. I finish the presentation, I'll, <laughs> I'll turn my screen on and everyone can see my ugly mug. Uh, you're very right about the retirement business. I'm not really sure that I've had a retirement yet. It's a bit like the, you know, Clayton's retirement. It's, uh, it's, gonna, it's out there somewhere. I've just got to, I've just got to find it. Um, it's a privilege to have a chance to speak to you all today and uh, particularly uh, to speak to you along with Stuart is, who sounds like a very accomplished gentleman. Um, I'll, I'll get into it with no further ado, Amanda, because I, I know that time's a bit limited. What I'd, what I'd like to try to do today is give you a bit of an overview of what's going to, of what is uh, happening with the global uh, COVID pandemic and to talk a little bit about uh, the immunisation issues, why why vaccination is so important, what the available vaccines are, some of the issues around uh, side effects and adverse events and the difference between them, um, what the, the measurement of risk is, if you like, or the assessment of risk that, that all of us make in, in uh, deciding whether or not we should get vaccinated and then just summarising the, the situation. And, uh, and as you say, I'm sure there'll be some questions afterwards. I'll just show a few charts and maps just to give you an indication of, of what's going on. Uh, this data is, is put together by a, by a group called Our World in Data that operate out of Johns Hopkins University. Um, they collect data from all over the world. They're pretty reliable and I tend to use their, their numbers because I think they've got a, a very good uh, general background check on what they say. And what this data says is that so far, in the course of the of the pandemic from January 2020 through till now, there's been over 160 million confirmed cases of COVID in the world, and about 3.3 million people have confirmed been confirmed to have died from COVID. Now you can see a, a little caveat up the top of the screen there that these guys uh, say about their data, which I think is very valid, 
the, the numbers shown here are in all uh, likelihood underestimates because we know that they're based on whether or not people got tested for COVID disease. If you didn't get tested for COVID disease and you died from COVID disease, you wouldn't be counted as a COVID death. Uh, this is one of the things I'll come back to a little bit later that messes the numbers up a bit. But what we can be very confident about is that this is the absolute minimum number of people who've become sick or died from COVID in the last um, 16 months or so. The next slide shows a, a map and it tries to, to paint a bit of a picture country by country showing death rates per million people by, uh, as a result of COVID. Um, to, me to measure a rate, a mortality rate by, by a million people in the, in the population is a common way of looking at it. And it just basically puts things a little bit into proportion. Um, because absolute numbers are going, to, are going to be very, very different depending on whether or not there's a very big population or a smaller population. So rates are the, the common ways that public health people to, are used to, uh, to try to understand what's happening in a relative way. Uh, you can see a very heavy concentration of dark colours in the Americas, both North America and South America, and in Western Europe, with a bit of a patchwork of other colour colours through the Middle East and generally very light colours over, over much of Asia and, of course, Australasia and Oceania. Uh, I'll come back to that caveat that I mentioned earlier. Just because it's a light colour doesn't mean that COVID hasn't been killing people or making them sick. It just means that there hasn't been very much testing going on in a lot of parts of the world, and I'll show you that with a, with a map a little bit later on. So. When you hear about numbers from a particular country or a particular area, always take them with a little bit of a grain of salt, unless you know that they've been doing a lot of testing in those places. So on this map, you can see Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, places like Taiwan, Singapore, where there's been a lot of testing going on. Uh, and you can be pretty confident that the low disease numbers or low death numbers are accurate. But a lot of other parts of the world, you simply can't be be sure of that. The next map just shows what's happening now, basically. It's a, it's a rolling seven day average of deaths. So I'm using this to sort of point out the current hotspots uh, globally. Um, the Americas, of course, still very active, although the, the US is coming down very quickly in, in terms of the number of illnesses and the number of deaths. They have uh, really pushed their immunisation program extensively and, and their deaths are dropping off the edge of a cliff as they are in the UK and some parts of Western Europe. But you can see that there, there are new, very active areas. India has been in the news so much lately, I don't need to, to point that out very much. Um, India, I think, averaging over the last seven days about 10,000 deaths a day, confirmed, tested uh, deaths a day. Um, you can see Indonesia and, and some other countries in Southeast Asia where they're more active, the darker colours, uh, and Japan where they're battling a number of, um, of outbreaks at the moment. Then we got on to the next slide where it just gives you an indication of what I was talking about here, these confounding factors in, in working out exactly what's going on. Because if you don't test for the virus, all things being equal, you're not going to find it. Uh, and the less testing you do, the less cases you're going to find. So you'll see much of Africa here where the, the Johns Hopkins people don't even have any data from the last 10 days. So they just put those countries in grey. I mean, we don't really know what's going on with testing at all. Uh, you have some countries like Brazil where Traditionally, they've actually got a pretty good testing regime, but for whatever reason, data for the last 10 days isn't available, so they're left off the map. But then you'll see other countries like Nigeria or even Indonesia, and you'll see that in those countries, it's either less than 20 per thousand people that have been tested. Uh, less than 2% of the whole population in Nigeria has been tested since the pandemic began. And in Indonesia, it's less than 5% of the population that's been tested since the pandemic began. So um, it's in with those sorts of testing rates, it's very, very hard to understand really what's happening with the disease and reported case numbers are a gross underestimate. 
So I just mentioned a few of these things, these factors that uh, affect the measurement, um, the testing rates being the most important one, but there are others too, um, what's called vital statistics reporting. So this is the reporting system that works to record deaths, for example, as well as births in a country. And if you don't have a very strong vital statistics system, you're gonna miss quite a number of deaths. Um, and the, the last element is the attribution of the cause of death. And this is associated with testing. Unless you're testing people, you don't really know whether they've died from COVID or not. So for, for people who are dying without being tested, if they're dying of COVID, they're not being recorded as COVID deaths. So just a few basic messages about the, the pandemic. I mean, we know, okay, 160 million people minimum have been infected. Probably the, the figure is probably something like five times that, but anyway, that's what we, we, we can definitively say. Confirmed deaths top 3.3 million. Again, we know that, that the actual number of people who've died from COVID is much, much higher than that, but we can't laboratory confirm many of those deaths. We do know that in a lot of countries that are similar to Australia, the USA, the UK, Italy, you know, very, very similar societies and economies and whatever, the confirmed COVID death rates are now at about 2,000 per million population. That's, that's roughly one in 500 people. Now, to put that in perspective, Australia, which has had 1,000 deaths from COVID so far, would have had 50,000 deaths if we were dying at the same rate as Americans and the Brits. Um, so even in, in those countries, in the USA, UK, Western Europe, uh, that have good testing and, and good vital statistics systems, it's very likely that at least some COVID-19 deaths are being missed. And in countries with, with poor testing regimes or weak vital statistics, then the likelihood is that we're missing the bulk of what's happening in terms of cases and deaths. And a good example is South Africa, where, where there is not a bad um, vital statistics system, but their testing hasn't managed to keep up. There, the, the Medical Research Council does an analysis every week of what they call excess deaths. That's deaths that are above the average number of deaths that you would expect for that particular week on an average year. Uh, and what they are saying basically is that the COVID-19 deaths in South Africa may be three times higher than the number that have been confirmed simply because their testing regime couldn't keep up. So. In summary, I mean, basically, what we can say is that, that COVID as a disease is not a, a, a simple, small, forgettable thing. It's a disease with a very, very significant public health impact. So then we hit the question of what then is the issue with vaccination? Why are we vaccinating? And I, I think I partly answered that question with my last statement. Uh, it's a nasty disease, and if there's any way that we can we can mitigate the effects of the disease and, and protect individuals and protect the community, then we should be doing it. One of the complications, though, is that this is a new human disease. So that means that there's no sort of background population memory of the disease. We don't have any any basic immunity to the disease anywhere in the population, except for those people who've already been infected. Um, if you've, you've got a totally unexposed population like Australia, there's only basically two ways that we can become immune. We can either get infected and there's all the risks of becoming sick and dying if we do that, or we get vaccinated. And of course, there is a risk with the vaccination as well. I'll come to that later. But that risk with the vaccination is infinitely smaller than the risk from the disease. Uh, being infected with the virus, if you've had COVID disease, you're probably going to have pretty good immunity for, for a reasonable period of time. Um, but then, of course, you've got to risk the fact that you, you could get very, very seriously ill or you could die. Uh, the vaccines that are in play so far seem to offer very good protection against sickness and death um, and a much lower risk of a serious adverse event. Uh, um, and then I'll go into those adverse events very briefly in a minute. We've got three available vaccines uh, in Australia, two of them that are currently available and one that will be available within a few months. Uh, all three of these vaccines are um, have been shown to be really 
highly protective against serious illness and death. One of the original issues with the vaccines was after the clinical trials, no one was very sure whether vaccine could really provide much community protection, whether it would whether it would interfere with the way the virus transmitted from one person to another. Um, so, you know, individual protection is one thing, but this sort of community protection that you achieve by having uh, a vaccinated person being less good at, at, at passing the virus on to someone else, that was very, very uncertain. The recent data from the UK and from the USA and other places shows though that there is a distinct effect of, of vaccination on general transmission of the virus. So it, it not only offers individual protection, but for most people who've been vaccinated, it, it is much more difficult for them to get infected and to then pass the virus on to someone else. So that's really good news. So all three of these vaccines are pretty good vaccines. The, the latter two, the Pfizer, BioNTech and the Moderna are both made using a, using a relatively new technique. They're, they're what's called um, mRNA vaccines and they're uh, sort of pretty cutting edge in terms of, of um, biological biologicals production. Uh, but the AstraZeneca vaccine is also no slouch. It's a pretty good vaccine. I just mentioned how effective the, the vaccines are at preventing serious disease and death, and the fact that there's increasing evidence that they that they have a big impact on the transmission of the virus. This doesn't mean that every single person who gets the vaccine is going to be completely immune and can't get infected. No vaccine is 100% effective, but all of those vaccines seem to be pretty good at achieving both personal protection and helping protect against the spread of the virus in the community. Now we get on to this vexed question of side effects and, and uh, adverse events following immunisation and, and what they mean. There's a bit of an issue because what tends to happen is that people sort of confuse the two things. Side effects are, are those responses that are relatively normal following a vaccination. And every vaccine that's given to anyone has some sort of side effect uh, um, that, that's associated with it. These side effects are very, very common. Most of the people who are vaccinated will, will report one or more of them. Um, what you tend to have with the, uh, the uh, COVID vaccines, which is very, very similar to, um, to other vaccines, is that you have you know, fever, you have headache, the, the, wherever the vaccine was injected, there's pain there, uh, this tiredness, weakness, uh, muscle soreness, joint soreness. This is very, very common. Now, I can attest to that. My, my wife and I got our at the first dose of um, AstraZeneca a, a couple of weeks ago now, and we both had 24 hours where we were feeling pretty ordinary. <laughs> but it, uh, it resolves relatively quickly. Generally, within 48, 72 hours after vaccination, you're back to normal again uh, and you go on with the rest of your life. Adverse events are a different thing altogether. This is this is the very rare, uh, serious or life-threatening kind of, of reaction that occurs against a vaccine. And for the the COVID vaccines that are that are currently uh, on the market or out there being used, there is some sort of serious adverse event that roughly occurring in between four and eight cases per million doses of vaccine that are given. Uh, some of this, these adverse events can be very serious if they're not detected and responded to. For AstraZeneca, it's uh, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. It's a, it's a very unusual, a rare clotting disorder. It's, it's not like other clotting syndromes. The only thing that it seems to be like is a, a similar syndrome that occurs with a, a blood thinning drug called heparin. Um, for Pfizer, uh, the issue has been anaphylaxis, which is a massive allergic reaction. Uh, the, that occurs in, for Pfizer at less frequency than thrombocytopenia occurs uh, with AstraZeneca, but between the two of them, it's roughly four to eight cases per million doses. <clears throat> so that means 
there is a risk in taking vaccines. It's a very, very, very small risk, but it is a risk. And that means we've got to measure up a relative risk in thinking about uh, vaccination in the context of this pandemic that we've got going on at the moment. Uh, for COVID then, what we have to think about is the relative risk of getting very sick or dying from, from the virus or, uh, you know, versus having that uh, potentially serious adverse reaction to immunisation. If we were in the United Kingdom, there wouldn't be any issue whatsoever. I mean, there's not really a question there because uh, UK, USA, most of Western Europe, many other parts of the world, certainly India at the moment, your risk of getting infected and dying from COVID is stratospherically higher than your risk of having anything go wrong with the vaccine. So you are much, 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 much safer being vaccinated than you are being not vaccinated. For those of us living in Australia, it's a little bit confusing because we've gotten away with a very low risk of infection so far. You know, we're at, we're at about 30,000 infections in the whole country since the pandemic began and only a thousand deaths. So we've been really lucky in that respect. But in that in that context now, it's it's uh, a bit of a, a, a struggle for us to uh, decide on relative risk. Should we take the risk, the you know, eight, eight in one million or one in 125,000 uh, risk that we, we're going to get uh, a thrombosis with thrombocytopenia, a clotting, a clotting reaction, or should we take the risk that we're not going to get infected because everything is going to be fine. Um, unfortunately, that premise that everything is going to be fine is a bit of a false measure. It, it essentially assumes that the risk of being infected with COVID is not going to go up. It's going to stay exactly as it is now. Uh, unfortunately, it will certainly go up. Uh, and I think the, the uh, experience of Victoria at the moment is a case in point. We cannot keep this thing out. It is, it is a, a factor of human life from now on. It is a disease that's now endemic in, in humans. So unless we completely cut ourselves off from everyone else in the world and everywhere else the vaccine is, is circulating, the, vac the virus will be reintroduced to Australia on a regular basis. I just tried to sort of graphically describe that relative risk in the, in the next chart. Um, I, I tried to measure some of the, the, the risk uh, in terms of the rate of death versus the rate of serious reaction. Uh, so the rate of death of, is a population-based measure and serious reaction is, is per 1,000 vaccinations. Um, as I mentioned, across the whole UK population, the, the risk of death in the past 18 months from COVID disease is about two in every thousand people or one in every 500. Um, the risk of dying from COVID if you're infected is very, very similar in both the UK and Australia. That's that bar with CFR, that's called case fatality rate. So the, the known risk of dying if you're infected is about 30 in every thousand people in both countries or about 3% of the people who get infected who have died. Uh, across the whole population in Australia, so far, the risk of infection is only 0 0.04 per thousand people. Nonetheless, sorry, the risk of dying across the whole population is, is 0 0.04 per thousand people. But if you look at the risk of a serious event happening from the vaccine, the AstraZeneca clotting or the Pfizer anaphylaxis, you see that even in the context of Australia with so few infections, there is still less risk in being vaccinated than being exposed to the virus in the general community. So as a summary, COVID-19 is, is a nasty, dangerous, often lethal disease, and we're stuck with it. It's now endemic in humans. It's going to be around for a very long time. The vaccines that we have, are very good in terms of giving high levels of protection against sickness and death. And they also have a benefit across the community in, in helping to reduce the risk of viral transmission. It's clear that even in our setting, the relative risk of disease and death from COVID 
is far higher than the risk of an adverse event following immunization. That's even in our current situation, which as I said before, is not stable and we are likely to face further incursions of disease as time goes on. So the conclusion that, that we draw from this is that the relative risk assessment favors a decision to get vaccinated for just about everyone. And I'll, I'll leave it there, Amanda. I apologize if I went on a little bit long. No, thanks, Chris. Chris, we've got one question that's come in from the audience. In terms of processes, what is the percent, the in, sort of an increased likely percentage of people try to vaccinate on site compared to sending, which I realise that there is some difficulties around that at the moment, um, versus trying to send people to a local vaccination centre. Have you seen any statistics on that? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, Amanda? So what's the likely percentage if plants are able to have um, vaccinations on site, what's the likely increase in uptake by able, being able to vaccinate on site versus trying to encourage employees to go to a clinic off site? Look, in my experience, the easier you make it for people to access vaccination, the more likely they are to, to uptake. I mean, that's, that's common sense. It's certainly been backed up in, in, in all the work that I've done. Um, so my instinct, if, if, I, if I was running an enterprise and I had enough employees, I would be, I would be hoping that there was a, a solution where I could get vaccination on site because I think it would make life a lot easier for everyone. Um, there, are, there are some sort of um, alternatives to that that, uh, that are better than, I mean, to me, the worst alternative is just to say to everyone, go off and make an appointment for yourselves and good luck, um, because I think it's pretty difficult for people. So the alternative is to uh, make an arrangement with a local provider and sort of see if you can book blocked block periods, block times with that provider or with that mass vaccination facility to say, hey, in this during this period of time, um, I'd like a, a four hour window for my my employees to be able to uh, click themselves in. We are, we are phase 1B priority after all. Um, so those slots in that four hour period should be all for my guys this week, next week and the week after or something like that. So you can then bus people down if you have to, or you can, you know, uh, in some way make it a more collective process than just um, pushing people to make their individual arrangements. Great, well, thanks very much, Chris. Um, and you've escaped a lot of questions, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the question bar and we will endeavour to get those answered by Chris. Um, Chris, I'm not sure if you're gonna stay on for the rest of the presentation, otherwise we can send those questions direct to you. But thank you it's very much for your time. Sorry. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks to uh, everyone for listening. Yes, and please don't hesitate to get in touch with me if you've got some further questions. Great, thank you. And now we'll hand over to Stuart, who we can see on our screen. That's a picture of Stuart. And um, he's gonna give an update from the Department of Agriculture. So thanks very much for your time too today, Stuart. Oh, look, thank you very much for, for your time. And, and it's pretty hard for a segue from COVID-19 and its effects on, on us to um, export legislation, but I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so this is me. Unfortunately, I, I cannot uh, get my vision working on the computer, so I'm putting up my ugly mug to start with um, in this case. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, and like Chris said, it, it is actually a, a privilege to, to be here. So I shall just move this out of the way. So I'm hoping um, everyone can see that now, full screen. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, today I, I thought I'd introduce probably some of the topics that are of most interest to, to people uh, out there, our audience, and, and probably of most interest to us at the moment as well, to be frank. So I'll be briefly talking about some of the new export legislation that we've had 
put in place recently, the 28th of March. I'll also talk about uh, some of the key priorities in Meet Mod, mainly talking about the uh, AAO transition and point of entry rejections in small stock. And I'd just like to point out that it often appears as port of entry in MyCore, but uh, it's, it's actually uh, more correctly point of entry. So the new export legislation and uh, what are some of the on-plant implications? Well, I'd just like to first put up this, this structure. It, it is a little bit different. We have the new Export Control Act sitting at the top with the export control rules sitting off to the side. I just want brief mention of this Export Control Consequential Amendments and Transitional Provisions Act 2020. But I will come back to that shortly. So, so within the export control rules, uh, the main ones of, of interest are, are the wild game uh, rules, the poultry rules, the meat rules, and the rabbit and ratite rules. We no longer call it subordinate legislation. We've been told by the legal people that that's no longer correct and moving from uh, uh, orders to rules, though we just call them the relevant rules now. The structure is different, as I mentioned. The Export Control Act, and, and you may well see this on looking through it, it consists of a series of chapters. Uh, and here's the first five uh, listed here. Preliminary exporting goods, accredited properties, registered establishments and approved arrangements. What we, or what has been done is that the export control rules are actually listed with the same chapters. However, if there is no provisions in a particular commodity, then that chapter doesn't appear. So for instance, we know that the meat rules have accredited properties, and therefore that relates to the accredited properties chapter three within the Export Control Act. There is no chapter three within uh, the dairy rules as there is no uh, provisions for accredited properties. The purpose is pretty much the same. You'll notice the Export Control Act has actually been expanded and, and the commodity rules have actually been uh, con um, compressed a little bit. There's less information in those. However, if we look at the Export Control Act, it really is controlling export of prescribed goods, setting conditions and uh, restrictions for export, registered establishments, authorized offices, and the penalties involved. The export control rules, setting out the requirements for the specific food commodities, and the area that we're working heavily on in the moment is the policy. Uh, the detail and the guidance on how to meet these requirements and any forms that we can actually put in place as well. I just want to pick up on a couple of things and a couple of chapters before we, we move into some of the, the nitty gritty of, of, of some of the changes on plant. Preliminary and exporting groups, which really is chapters one and two, covers these things here, uh, timeframes, definition, uh, exemptions from the Act, government certificates, but also in the details in which goods are considered prescribed and which are not. I just wanted to point out that under the new rules, um, animal food and pharmaceutical material are no longer prescribed goods. So they no longer require export permits, unless of course there's important importing country requirements. Chapter nine, uh, we'll move to chapter nine. One of the things I'd like to point out here, this is authorized officers and approved auditors. One of the things to point out here is we now actually have inclusion of third party. And so the AAOs uh, that work on plant are now included in the authorized officer section, talks about their um, functions, hours, talks about training for qualifications, and of course, cost recovery as well. Now, there's this period that we're actually in where there's a lot of material being developed over a long time for the Export Control Act 1982 and all its orders. And we've now suddenly gone, it seems, to Export Control Act 2020 and the rules. 
we have to have transitional arrangements in place. We cannot expect to change everything overnight in order to uh, meet with expectations. And so we have, as I mentioned before, the Expo Control Consequential Amendments and Transitions Provisions Act 2020, which allows material from the old Act to actually still be viable in transitional provisions within the new Act. Time take, it allows us time to actually uh, change over, but make sure that regulations and regulatory um, procedures are fully covered. Again, this Act allows for material from the old orders to be fully covered in this transitional period to the new Act. As I mentioned, the new Act is actually substantially larger because we are moving not only material from the old Act, but material from the old orders across as well. And Chapter 12 of each of the relevant rules, the new rules, allows for transition of the old orders material moving to the new rules material. For example, the meat inspection services. So what are some of the things that have actually um, caused a lot of discussion? We have actually seen that there are changes in, in the loadout uh, procedures. We now talk about the supervis supervising of loadout and how that fits in with the old request for permit validator. We have taken consul, we have talked to a lot of people, and at the moment we are not making any changes. We're going to have a consideration period, we're going to have further consultation with industry, and we may be a view to amending this legislation uh, in order to meet with uh, what is practical within an industry situation. We're actually visiting and reviewing and all sorts of things in the background to try and get this right moving forward. And of course, I just wanted to mention, that is for non-EU. Okay. When we actually move into the EU and the UK, there was likely to be no current change anyway. The loadout documentation ended up with the departmental authorised officer to actually validate the RFP and XDOC inspector. Export Standards Branch advised that we should not make any changes to the EU and the UK markets. Uh, we keep that in place until there is opportunity for further discussion and if any changes are likely to be made. But at the moment, there will be none. Something that is changing and something that many people may already have experienced is the process for registrations and approved arrangements. Everyone is familiar with the EX26, I'm sure, form, which <clears throat> is a short way of, uh, of uh, looking at the application for registration and notification to the Secretary for a change in details of an establishment. What is happening now is that form has actually been split into three, an EX26A, B and C application. The EX26A is for a new registration for an approved arrangement. The EX26B is to vary a registration or an approved arrangement. And that includes changes in management, company details, operations, and any structural changes. And the EX26C is to revoke a registration or approved arrangement, to revoke current occupier, and to update the registration with a new occupier. Now, the department can be involved in these because sometimes the revocation is not in the interest of the establishment of the approved arrangement, and so we wouldn't ask someone to do that themselves. Okay, if I just move that 
material up there and discussion of the A, B, and C. The establishment completes these. They are signed electronically and they're submitted to the department by an email address. Once they're submitted to the department, they enter a consideration period. What we now say is the area technical managers that are an integrated establishment do not accept these applications. There's no problem in talking to OPVs at all and ATMs about that. In fact, we encourage it, but the applications are not accepted by these groups. They're actually um, submitted directly to the certification management group within uh, the meat exports branch. In terms of consideration periods, For registered establishments, either new or variation, it's 120 days. For approved arrangement, either new or variation, it's 120 days. What I'd like to uh, emphasize here is it's not 120, sorry, it's up to 120 days, it's not 120 days. In many cases, this process may be significantly shorter than 120 days. Fit and proper person assessment is something that will probably take a little bit longer and therefore um, giving opportunity for that to be conducted in that period of time is why we probably have 120 days. But I must emphasize that a lot of these will be a great deal shorter than that. We have had a few establishments thinking that it's 120 days for everything. Now, I'm going to put this up here. Um, basically, I, I don't want anyone thinking that this is a cop out by the department. If a decision has not been made prior to the consideration period expiring, the application will be deemed to be refused. CMG will notify the applicant in writing. What that is in there is basically a hurry up for us. The last thing that we want to do is to actually uh, notify the applicant um, due to um, delays at our end that an application has not been successful. That won't look good for us and it certainly uh, won't be easy to manage at the industry level. So it's, it's our hurry up, it's not actually uh, So, if I can move on to an area that we are currently developing policy that should be on Elmer 3 very, very shortly uh, with EMIAC consultation, industry consultation. It's this area of significant variations that we hoped through consultation with industry is a way of speeding up processes on approved arrangements. So currently, significant approved arrangement variations goes through the EX26B process. And what I like to think and others have described is a significant variation is an amendment to an approved arrangement that has the potential to either adversely affect compliance or adversely affect the accuracy of assessing compliance. When this policy is released, each of the rules will, sections will actually be part of that policy for review, um, but I refer everyone to chapter five for these within the meat rules. It'll be chapter five in all the commodity rules. Now, this is probably a detailed slide, but um, it's not something I, I want to dwell on. It's really the process that I'd like to talk about here most. As we say, significant A variations go to an EX26B application. Those variations may either be for personnel, they either be operational, it could be for wholesomeness, which often is, is a vague word that we actually have trouble compartmentalizing. 
and product integrity. Within personnel, it's really variations to persons in management or control. Change in persons who may be making declarations such as new transfer certificates, export permits, in manufacturing, supplying, possessing, altering, ordering, or using official marks. In operational, it could be adding new operations, adding operations for the preparation of, of uh, other goods, and preparation of goods using alternative techniques or regulatory arrangements approved under the Act. Wholesomeness, changes that may jeopardize or affect the ability uh, to assess whether wholesomeness is maintained, and, and this is really uh, within the HACCP programs. And product integrity, changes that affect the ability to ensure the export product integrity is retained. Something I'd like to just mention here is, is a, basically a, 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 a triangle here showing a, an increase of, in what we believe is interpretive. Some of these areas can be interpretive, particularly the wholesomeness and perhaps product integrity. And we believe that a, an operations team is, is, is called for. And, and who do we think here? Well, I think quality assurance managers on plants, um, anyone else with skills or, or, or valuable experience to provide in the area on plant, and the OPV and the ATM. And in those groups, helping to make the decision as to whether something is a significant AA variation or not. Now, failure to seek approval of a significant variation may be considered a critical non-compliance. And this is why we encourage involving the OPV, the ATM, some of the senior team within the department in order to help look at that. But we believe that a lot of these once the process is ironed out, it should hopefully be straightforward. What about non-significant variations? Well, this seems like a pretty dumb statement, but in general, anything that does not meet the criteria of a significant is a non-significant variation. Now, these can be made uh, to the approved arrangement by the holder of that approved arrangement without prior departmental approval. The establishment should certainly make the OPV aware of non-significant uh, approved arrangement variations at the weekly meeting. And we suggest that uh, these be provided, uh, maybe in management issues, to the OPV. What the OPV is then encouraged to do, in fact, uh, instructed to do, is to place these within the management issues section of the weekly report to the area technical manager. So the area technical manager has visibility. And if on top of that, the field operations manager, the form also has visibility. These non significant variations must be documented in the approved arrangement, including reasons as soon as practical after being made. And this will take effect on the date the change is made to the approved arrangement. And of course, there has to be some view, visibility on this, and these will be assessed during regular audits of the establishment. Okay, and any non-significant variations made since the last audit should be prevented to the audit team at the entry meeting. So what we're trying to do is this is basically the draft of the meat export policy that we are hoping to have available for publication upline pretty pretty much describing what i have here uh, very very shortly okay so that's just some of the key points within legislation so um, in terms of meat modernization um, probably some of the interesting concepts here very happy to present in terms of background, meat modernization has been this co-design effort between the government and industry, and it really falls on the back of the EMIS um, system, which was a major reform program in 2010-2011. The EMIS has been was reviewed. Uh, it was commissioned by industry, Palladium, 
they found the system was fit for purpose, but that reforms or some reforms had not been fully adopted. And in June 2020, there was formation of the Meat Modernization Working Group, the MMWG. So the MMWG consists of AMEC, TEAS, and JBS, and with senior executive within the export division of the department. And their purpose was forward leaning, look to new stuff to modernize the meat export system. And they agreed to fully implement the AMIS reforms first implemented back in 2011. So there were six key projects to be delivered over the next 12 months. Of course, uh, this will be subject to agreement from the trading partners. The first one is inspection reform, the AAO model, and I will discuss that in more detail shortly. The second one is post-mortem inspection and disposition reform. Now in this, what we're looking at is basically a scientific review of the Australian standard, AS4696. And it was really held because of, of good science and uh, a want and need to preserve more of the carcass. And this has actually been already implemented within the domestic system. At the moment, they're looking at a licensing agreement between the Standards Australia, the Commonwealth States and Territories. And once that's actually executed, uh, the agreement will be enable the revision of the AS4696 as a result of these required reforms within postmodern inspection and disposition. Of course, there's audit reforms as well. And we now have this export meat systems audit program, the MSAP audits that run on about 50% of integrated plants with the other 50% uh, still looking at monthly audits. COVID actually taught us a lot here in terms of uh, one auditor acting remotely um, and how we can actually implement this across the entire um, uh, entire establishments, export establishments. And of course, uh, those that are actually showing mature systems, uh, mature, assurance, mature assurance systems, and a good history of performance, uh, they can move on to six monthly. And those, alternatively, um, that uh, are not, will probably be audited more frequently. So it's really for establishments to take greater responsibility and autonomy for what's going on. Risk-based auditing uh, is another one, um, and probably I, I overlap with what I said before, but it's really risk profiling. It's looking at establishments, um, those that are doing extremely well, um, there is a possibility of of considering a annual audits for those. And of course, those that aren't uh, will be audited more frequently. But again, trying to look at ways to streamline systems. Market access prioritization framework. So this is really, um, this was really developed by the department in consultation with the Australian Meat Industry Council to this, to really build a market access prioritization, prioritization framework and really where we can utilize and allocate resources best possible. And the department has actually proposed a market access negotiation policy, you know, to provide the best outcomes for industry. And one of those would actually be promoting the development of this AS4696 review and any add-ons add that might be associated with that with importing countries. And the last one in, in our priority network is uh, review of species testing. Now, most of you will be aware that species testing is really the assurance that we give our um, trading partners that the correct species is actually being exported and attested to on the health certificate, which is important because I sign those health certificates now 
uh, that we've got accurate labeling um, that identifies the product. What this proposal is suggesting here is that we review the current risks and transitions um, of responsibilities to industry. So this is actually a, a work in progress with industry consultation here to move species testing responsibilities on most of them to, to industry. So inspection reform. The department will no longer be responsible, will no longer, sorry, provide the FSMAs to perform post-mortem inspection where that function could be undertaken by an AAO. And in fact, um, over the period, we've been looking at replacing um, 70 full-time equivalent reductions in, in FSMAs, moving from 197 on plants to 127. So the FSMAs will now only be provided under limited circumstances. Some of you may be aware of that for importing country requirements. It started in March 2021. There was a six month transition period put in place. Most establishments have transitioned, are certainly well advanced for completion of this in September 2021. There is a whole group working um, on Meet Mod. Uh, I just simply uh, sort of plug into where those requirements are required by me to, to work up things, but I would encourage anyone to look at the Meat Modernization um, crew. Uh, you'll find them at meatmodernization.agriculture.gov.au and they'd be more than happy to answer any questions if you actually have those. Point of entry rejections. Uh, it's quite topical for us at the moment and uh, I won't spend uh, too much time talking about it, but I, I thought it might be of interest. If we actually take a look at point of entry rejections, this is where we have FSIS or other inspectors in overseas markets looking at product and decide, no, this is not suitable to be released um, in the uh, importing country. These are notifications uh, that have occurred uh, between the 1st of May last year and the 30th of April this year. These are called formal, these ones here. And what that is, is there's a formal request by the company, by the country, that an investigation and response take place by the department. Um, and that occurs by a strict due date. You often see these as critical incident responses. I see these as critical incident responses. So as you can see, uh, the ones that have actually occurred, the rejection type, either ESTEC contamination off color um, from the US, from Canada, one contamination in China residue detection. You'll see the majority of those occurring are contaminations from the US. What we're seeing is that there is a preponderance of these to be small stock. And in fact, if we look from 2015 to current, we'll see that there was a drop off 2017, 18 and 19, an increase in 2020. And again, in just the first four months of this year, there have already been four reported. So if we actually increase that by another two times, you'll see that it'll be pretty similar to what we had in 2020. So far, the uh, point of entry rejections in 2021 have actually been small stock related and contaminations are an important one. Now, formal put point of entry rejections for the US. What I'd like to just mention here is that there are 65 FSIS inspectors working at 119 points of entry in the United States. What you try and do is to get all your inspectors measuring in the same way, get everyone on the same page. And as you know, that, that can actually be difficult. They have a directive to work off, this directive here that was created in 2019, 2017, sorry. 
and this is a snapshot from that directive and it's looking at livestock feces and ingested contamination this is the identification chart that those inspectors work off so if we take a look at small stock where we're having a few problems anything green brown or black in terms of color and anything fibrous or plant-like in terms of texture enters the realm that an FSI, FSIS inspector could call uh, on either faces or ingester. Now, when we review what we've seen, there are definitely um, images coming back to us that look like faces or ingester. However, there are images coming back to us that we would argue are grass seeds or material that has not actually been through the digestive tract. So what the department is doing at the moment is working very hard with the trading partner, particularly the United States, to try and get on the same page as these um, inspectors in terms of what we call ingest and faces and what has not entered through the digestive tract. However, I think we have to be mindful too of the interpretation that an inspector might actually make for some of this material coming through. The last thing I'd just like to talk about is the informal POE rejections. These are notifications between May 2020 and April 2021. This is just really a monthly summary report and uh, investigation and responses from the department occur periodically. And as you can see, discrepancies between health certificates and goods for South Korea is an important one as it is for China. So I think that's where I'd like to just stop. I'm sorry if I've gone on a little bit long, but happy to take any questions that I, I can answer. And if I can't, I will try and find out. Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for for uh, uh, presenting uh, a lot of that information. I've, I've got a couple of questions um, that have come through from, from uh, the, uh, the, the audience. Uh, one of them is, is a, certainly around, um, around uh, verification activities. It says here, yeah, given con continuation of COVID concerns, will there be a review of legislation to cater for remote technologies and interventions to allow remote assessment, training, and perhaps accreditation, perhaps a new ISO standard? Well, look, COVID certainly has told us a lot of lessons. There is a very large um, package to look at digital systems within the department. And uh, uh, there are a few of those at the moment. The question was in regard to what type of um, remote, remote, uh, so remote technologies and interventions to allow remote assessment training and perhaps accreditation. Yeah, I'm not so sure. I, I certainly know that, that the remote is continuing within the ATM space. Uh, there is going to be no changes there. It's going to be one on site and one remote. There is There has been discussion of that and no change at present there. I'm not so sure about the remote accreditation. Um, I guess I could look into that. Certainly, I can make a note of that and try and find out from the appropriate people. Okay, thanks. And the other, the other, yeah, I got two other questions. Who are uh, obviously people are interested in the information you've got on those slides and asking if there's a, a possibility for us that uh, when we do because we we um, post these. Uh, uh, webinars uh, later on, if we could um, potentially post the or, or provide the uh, slides from from these presentations, Stuart, is that a possibility? 
Well, I will certainly get back to you on that. I'll just check, make sure that there is no one who, I don't see any problem with that um, in terms of this information, but I will certainly get on to Matt and find that out, turn that around for you. Perfect, thank you. Um, I don't think there are any other questions on there. Amanda, do you have any questions that have come to yourself? No, Matt, that's all the questions that have come through. So thanks everyone for joining today's webinar and a big thank you to Stuart and Chris for um, taking the time out of their day to give us an update on both where the department is and the legislative changes and also an update on the COVID vaccination. So um, thanks thanks again. We I just wanted to call out, we are just... A, in about to release and we will send it out with the copy of this webinar, a new COVID vaccine poster that's uh, being created by Respond Global. So we'll make sure that we include that on the mail distribution that will have the link to this webinar. Also don't forget that um, members can sign up up to two or three people per site to undertake the COVID Marshall course. So, and you can get more information on that off the AMPC website. And just in concluding, our next webinar is scheduled for next Thursday and is a complete change of topic. And we're going to be learning and getting more information around low cost solar PV. So some information will come out on that either later this afternoon or tomorrow. So thanks again, everyone. And we hope we'll see you on future webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you all.